Hello and welcome to the new episode of Keeping It Honest with Dashfight. Our guest today is none other than Justin Wong, the legend himself. Hello, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Um, you know, just uh, another day, another time in our life. And, you know, just been pretty stoked about recent events of like all the new fighting games coming out. Fire 6 has been doing good. Mortal Kombat 1 finally got to play a little bit. Tekken 8, it's like, you know, they're showing off some stuff. So it's a good time to be a, a fighting game player, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you like uh, what you see or is it just mainly you're playing it because it's new? So obviously there, for me personally, I'm always about the honeymoon phase uh, when it comes to a new fighting game. I always will like enjoy a new fighting game no matter what. Um, even if it's like they have like pros and cons, but I do personally think that um, Street Fighter 6 is, is a really fun and great game. Uh, Mortal Kombat 1 was like really fun as well too just because like you know I, I i i wasn't the biggest fan of mortal kombat 11 uh because there was not really too many combos compared to like mortal kombat 9 mortal kombat 10 so when mortal kombat 1 said hey we're gonna bring back combos we're gonna have assist as well too and a person like me who loves to play marvel games i mean it's already like a huge step up right a huge Huge improvement for me in my perspective, like how to get me interested in playing Mortal Kombat 1. So I think they did a great job on that one, for sure. Uh, speaking of Marvel, uh, given your origin as the unbeatable Marvel vs. Capcom legend, do you wish for it to make a comeback or does your interest lie more in Street Fighter these days? Hmm. So like you, you, you're you asking if I wanted Marvel vs. Capcom like in general, like 3 to come back is like, no, as like, like a maybe, main thing? No, maybe a new game or something like that. I mean... If there is a new game out there, obviously, you know, I would still say the same thing where I'm like, I'm going to play it. I'm going to play it a lot. Um, Man, please, (laughs) please don't, please, please don't, you know, wish that upon us. I feel like there's too many good fighting games out at the moment. It's, it's, it's too hard to really think about like, if there was a Mario's Capcom 4, how, like, which game would I choose between Street Fighter 6 or Mario's Capcom 4? Because I haven't put so many hours in in a new fighting game in a long time. Let me let me check how many hours I have on Steam already. Because, like, I've been playing a lot. Um, and it's just one of those things where I'm just like, man, Street Fighter 6 has just been taking over a lot. So I put almost, like, already 100 hours in the game. Um, and that's just, that, and that's just, like, me streaming. So that means I streamed the game probably around, like, over, like, maybe 90 hours total. That's a lot. Uh... And the game just came out like last week, right? So I don't want a new Mars Capcom 4 to come out <laughs> because then I would be like, what do I do? Like, you know, how do I I manage all this stuff? Because so, yeah. So to me, you know, like I would be super excited if Mars Capcom 4 got announced. Um, and, you know, I don't think it would come out this year anyway if it did get announced. But that would be fantastic. I mean, who doesn't want more fighting games in the space? But really, like, I think, like, all my eggs in the basket are just playing Street Fighter 6. Um, because it's new, because it's fresh, the online's amazing. Uh, I could play people, like, literally in Japan, you know? Like, that's a, that's a, that's something we really needed uh, for the online world. So it's, it's great that I could just play nonstop. And they have so many different modes and options, like... I started messing up with Avatar Battles and I, you know, it's pretty janky, but uh, it's super fun at the same time. So yeah, I'm like, I'm all in for Street Fighter 6. Yeah, that's good to hear because we all enjoy when you play and have fun and watch you on streams. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've also been actively exploring all sorts of retro fighting games uh, in the last few years. Is there uh, like, you, I know you said like you don't want Marvel vs. Capcom right now, but like in the future, two or three years, is there any retro fighting game you wish there was a new game in the series of? Mm. Maybe a Capcom versus SNK three. Um, I think that would be super good, just because like I think now it's like a perfect time because a lot of people they really do like fans and everything. They get excited when collaborations happen. I feel like Tekken Seven did such a great job. Uh, Mortal Kombat Eleven did such a great job. Of like bringing those characters together and everything, um, 
So it would be cool if they had like a new verse, like a new game where it's like two main like big IPs like battle out like a like a versus game. Because obviously, we, like we know, like Mars Catcom is like a staple, right? But like, um, you know, we we had Street Fighter Cross Tekken, it didn't do well, and we never had Tekken X Street Fighter. Tekken Seven is probably the closest thing we'll ever have for Tekken X Street Fighter because Akuma's in the game. Um, but you know, I feel like. If we had a new Capcom versus SNK, um, that would be pretty good. Because, you know, when Capcom versus SNK first came out, it, like, back in the day, it didn't have the greatest reputation um, of a game. But now, because of social media, YouTube, um, all this type of stuff where people get to see Capcom versus SNK now, the new fans are like, wow, this game is so awesome. It's the best thing in the world. I'm like, in my head, I'm like, where were they, like, you know, when I was growing up playing Capcom versus SNK, because everyone was like, they were so bored of the game, watching the game from a competitive standpoint, like, you know, it's like pretty like defensive, right? So, but now it's like revered as like one of the greatest fighting games that has ever been made. So I think having a, a CVS3 would be fantastic. Um, obviously, Third Strike's a really popular game. I wouldn't want a fourth version uh, because I feel like Third Strike is a, is one of the perfect fighting games of out there that has ever been made. So it's like I don't I don't think they can top third strike if they made a a fourth strike for example, like a fourth version. I don't think they can top third strike. So I would rather them just leave it alone, let it be like the classic that just like stayed on top. You know, it's kind of like the Mars Capcom scenario, right? Like Mars Capcom 3 is like or Mars Capcom 2, they consider that top those two games are like the, the best Marvel vs. Capcom game, right? But then Mars Cat Mars Capcom Infinite came out, and like I personally think it's a fun game, but obviously it doesn't hold the same pedestal of a Mars Capcom two and a Mars Capcom three. So I I I wouldn't want them to be like a a fourth like Free Fire three version. So I would rather have a Capcom versus SNK three. Um, if 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 there was a retro fighting game that could make a comeback, um, in the modern world. <laughs> Fascinating as thank you. And how do you know is if uh, a game is not your cup of tea? Uh, when and how do you decide to abandon it? Mm. I think for abandoning games, it's tough. Like, um, I did mention like Mortal Kombat 11. Like, I wasn't a really big fan of it, and I think it's because like Mortal Kombat 10 was so much fun in terms of combos. Uh, creativity, how fast the game played was. So when you play something prior and you're like, wow, this game is like the full package, right? And then they bring out another version, like the next version, and you're like, why does it seem like it's like a, you know, a downgraded version? Obviously the graphics for Mortal Kombat 11 were way better. Uh, but dude, I feel like the gameplay, like, can't really replace like Mortal Kombat 10 or even Mortal Kombat 9. Yeah, people um, also feel the same way about 9. It was faster. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I think like when it comes down to that, that's kind of when I stop playing the game. If it's like, oh, I, if I think the previous version is better and much more fun, like, and I give it a good amount of time too. Like, I'll play it a lot. I like dissect it a lot. And eventually I'll just get like kind of bored because I feel like I'm doing the same thing over and over again. If the game doesn't give me like lots of options, then I'm just like, I feel like I'm kind of over it. Right. So that's how I really feel about like a lot of like fighting games when I, what I want to like, okay, I stop playing or I switch over, you know? So I would say that's kind of like my definition of like abandoning the game, but that doesn't mean the game is bad. It's just, it's just not my cup of tea, like you said. Um, and for a person that plays multi fighting games, like all the time, I, I do tend to jump ship a lot because there's so many fighting games out there that I would probably want to play. And even after discovering like, you know, during the pandemic, going through all these retro fighting games, I'm like, man, I wish I played these games back in the day because these games are so fun. So getting better at all those old, older games, like, I, it was really fun. And, like, you know, and I know, like, people have the concept, oh, you jump ship because of, like, you know, the game doesn't have money or whatever, bro. And I'm like, bro, I play retro fighting games. <laughs> I'm like, there's no money in retro fighting games. I'm just literally playing it just because it's it's new for me and it's fun. And I, like I said, I, anytime I, I play a new fighting game, no matter... If how old it is or how new it is, if it's my first time playing it, I'm in the honeymoon phase, man. Like, 
Let me let me play let me play whatever fighting game I want to play. That's what it comes down to. Thank you. Um, your playstyle is famous, or for some pe people, infamous for focusing on spacing and defense. Uh, where, I, uh, how did you? What what pushed you towards this playstyle? Oh man, the defensive lame playstyle. <laughs> I would say it's because of where I grew up. Um, I grew up in Ch like New York, and they had arcades famous called Chinatown Fair. Um, and so this is a history lesson. So East Coast, East Coast back in the day were the turtles. They were defensive players and everything. And then West Coast, you have, you know, the, the classic Alex Vai slogan, uh, rush that, rush that shit down, right? RTSD. So we were like literally polar opposite play styles. So growing up with the arcade and just, I'm getting lamed out. I'm getting like poked out. I couldn't get in. I'm trying to rush down. I'm getting, I'm getting smoked. Um, and these are people like, uh, like Arturo Sanchez, Eddie Lee, Henry Sen, um, Eddie Lee in particular, he, he was like, before I came on the scene, like he was like the top dog. He won every game in the East coast. He was like the best in the East coast in like every game. Right. So I really took his place. I really took my place out from him. Um, like, and it was really just playing him so much, spending endless amount of quarters, just losing to him, him time overing me, him just running away from me. Like he really like watching his gameplay. He never like, he didn't teach me, but like I model my gameplay after him, right? Just watching him play, watching him dissect people, watching him frustrate people. I'm like, is this the way to, to win in fighting games? And that's kind of how I, I got into it was because of him really like he, cause he was, man, he was laming me out. He was not giving me an, an, um, anything. Like, like people know I'm like known for like Chung Li and Third Strike. Um, but when, uh, when he was still playing, um, I would, anytime I play him in the Third Strike tournament, I wouldn't pick Chung Li versus Chung Li against him because I can't beat him. I would, I would, I would pick Ken, try to rush him down in that situation, right? To try to overwhelm him. Um, cause that's the only way you can really, beat like such a defensive wall as if you have a stronger offense. So I would say my offense was naturally stronger than him because like, that's kind of where I naturally went to, but I guess like playing with him so much and understanding how he played, I learned how to play both type of styles. But when it comes down to like tournament play, obviously the, the defensive strategies, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's now it's lost in time. Like you don't really have too many defensive players anymore. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm really, appreciative of just like him just beating my ass all the time growing up and able to kind of like keep that legacy of like defensive play style alive thank you and speaking of chinatown fair arcade uh do you still keep in touch with some of the old rivals and friends you met there and uh what was the last time you you've been there yourself um man well chinatown fair is not chinatown fair anymore like you know i know that that place is still open uh, for business, but you know ownership has changed. They remodeled a lot, uh, so, and like every of everybody from the OGs, like they left. You know, they left. So they play at next level, um, and that's owned by Henry Sen, who was uh, one. Of, he was like the the tech, the tech guy at, the, at Chinatown Fair, right? He he would fix all the machines and everything. So he's 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 like. He's pretty much like one of like my father figures growing up. He like he really like was showing me the ways and everything. So I keep in touch with him a lot. Um, uh, I had a one of my, one of my best friends. He passed away. His name is John Gordon. Uh, he he would be the one taking me to tournaments when I was like fifteen years old. Um, so rest in peace to him. And like, let's see who else. Like I talked to Yipe still. I talked to Sanford still. Um, anyway, he just kind of disappeared. He's just like, you know what? I'm not playing games anymore. So real life type of stuff. So I get it. I understand. Um, but I talked to like, I would say 90% of people in, from Chinatown Fair um, these days. Not these days, but like in general, like, especially the Marvel's Capcom 2 community. Um, you know, we just, Marvel's Capcom 2, so it's like in my blood. So it's really hard to just like stop talking to them, right? In general. So we still hang out anytime I go to New York. Uh, but it has, it's been a long time since I've been in New York though, just cause there's not much, uh, 
you know, we just got, we just kind of like got through a pandemic and everybody started doing events and everything together. So it's really hard to kind of choose. I'm so comfortable staying home or like if I do travel, it'd be for like other stuff. So it's kind of hard for me to go to New York at this moment. Uh, but if I did, I would probably like, you know, hang out with like a lot of the, the old Chinatown fair guys usually. That's actually very heartwarming to hear. <laughs> yeah. So uh, speaking of your play style, um, do you think that your uh, this focus on uh, fundamentals gives you an edge when you pick up new fighting games? Uh, yeah, I, I do think when you, like with my play style, uh, learning new fighting games is, is much faster compared to other people learning new fighting games. I'm usually known to be like, oh yeah, like I figured out a game like within hours and then able to like play in a, I guess, uh, tournament per tournament level or whatever. Uh, but I think it's just more of just like, since I play so many fighting games and I went through so many different type of like mechanics of like different fighting games and also different character play styles that I can kind of like look at a character and I'm like, oh, this character reminds me of this character from this game, right? And then I'll use kind of like their move set, their and their like general strategy, and and try to develop that general strategy with this character. So I would say a lot of times that's kind of how I look um, at a fighting game is try to compare it from like a previous game that I played. Um, so and usually that works pretty well. Uh, I would say the only thing that's really kind of um takes a bit more uh learning process is the is the usage of like mechanics, right? Obviously every like video fighting game has a different type of like battle mechanic that they use. Like Street Fighter Six, they have the drive gauge, right? Um so I didn't I didn't start off the gate just like drive rushing everywhere. Like everyone's just drive rushing everywhere. I'm like, man, this is pretty good, right? So, but like when it comes to understanding a character, uh, how their moves work, um, how to put combos together without the battle mechanics, right? Without like game mechanics and everything like that. That's a pretty, pretty easy walk to the park to me. I could, it'll probably take like maybe less than an hour to figure out like some fun, cool combos. And obviously after that one hour of learning a character, then adding like mechanics into it, that will come after, right? So Yeah, it's 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 always a super fun process and you know, I'm I'm pretty stoked that we we can stream because then I can show people like my learning process of like how I do it. Like 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 recently I did like um I was streaming on Street Fighter Six and they're like, you know, I get a lot of questions because obviously the game is hype. Like like how do you learn a new character? Like it's it's so hard, blah blah blah. And you know, I literally showed them a breakdown of like, okay, let's pick a character I never played before and let's just go to town, right? So I did that. And they were able to see, like, I was able to, like, kind of make up combos, understanding what buttons to press, what's, what the special move does, and, I, like, and how do I use it in, a, in a, like, a match setting. So, it gets pretty fun doing that. So, I'm actually glad that, um, I guess, I have the experience to, to, to learn uh, fighting in characters pretty fast, like, just so I can show people now. So, it's always, it's always pretty fun. But, yeah, I definitely think the ability or well, the experience of me playing all these random fighting games since I was a kid uh, to help me learn new fighting games like that comes out now. People in esports often have this idea that as you get older, you can no longer compete with the younger generations. Uh, as a family man who isn't in his 20s anymore, has this been much of a problem for you? Mm, I think it's... I get I, I I can see why like people say that in like other games because I see like a lot of people like I don't really follow too much of like other genres besides fighting games but you know I'll, I'll definitely see people in like League of Legends say oh I'm retiring at like 20 something and I'm like retirement in 20 something for video games I'm like really surprised at that right um and while we have like players like already in their 40s in Street Fighter and they're still pro players right they're still strong like Sako, daigo they're in their 40s and they're still like sponsored and they still do like tournaments and everything like that so i think for for street fighter it could be a little different obviously like maybe reactions would get would get lessened uh, but i don't think reactions get lessened because of age 
I think reactions get lessened uh, because more res- more responsibilities come up for people like becoming a family man or pursuing their career uh, outside of fighting games. I think that's where because I feel like if you if you're sharp and you play a lot, um, you're gonna you're gonna be sharp. Like you're you're not gonna really miss a beat. Like I've been like with punishing like ever since playing Street Fighter Six for like over a hundred hours already. I've been with punishing. I've been like literally reacting to supers. I've been perfect parrying Honda. Everyone complain about Honda headbutts and Blanca balls off of full screen. I'm like, bro, you can just react, react to it and punish it. I could do all of that. And like, and there's a lot of players that are younger than me that they'll just stare at it. <laughs> and I'm like, bro, what are you doing? Right? So it just comes down to like, how sharp are you? Really, like, I, I don't think my um my reactions have gone less. I actually think uh it gotten better because I play a bit, I play a lot more now. Um, like even for third strike, like I never was able to with punish normals, uh, with supers, but now third strike, um, when I play like matches and tournaments, and everything, if you with a normal, like I, there's a good chance I'll super it now. Like even even like without even if I, cause like I'm like, how can I punish somebody? From so far, and but because I because I can't do button to the super anymore, right? So I'm like, oh, let me just try to do raw super. So I'm looking for that now, um, and it 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 works. Like so, a lot. I I I did level up, uh, my fighting game. I would say a bit because of that. But I would say like, for me and in, in me in general, I don't know. Like I I feel like I obviously have more things to do now. So because I have more things to do now. I can't just play 16 hours a day like I used to. Because I would used to play 16 hours a day, play with like lots of different people and like train. And that was kind of like my only like focus, right? Now it's just like, you know, I work, I have a, I have a family. Um, I, I do YouTube now. So I keep up a lot of like, kind of like, I was like that. I, I always, I'm always in a meeting every day. Um, so I probably have less time to play. I just need maybe I can sacrifice sleep because that's what I've been doing to play Street Fighter Six is sacrifice sleep. Uh, but I do feel good about uh about you know when it comes to playing fighting games and when you're getting older, I don't really see it being a like um like a negative. You know, I maybe maybe if some people like obviously everyone's different. They they have arthritis or something. Then obviously it it affects that. Uh, but when it comes to reactions, no, I, I don't think so. I think the more you play a fighting game, the more you're, um, you understand that specific fighting games, the more you see that specific normal you're looking for to whiff punish. Eventually, it's going to look like the Matrix, super slow, and you're just going to just smack it eventually. So that's kind of how I, I see it, bro. If like, I mean, I think like when you look at like Japanese players and they're in, like, they're, you know, forties or close to forties and they're reacting just as well as like people in their twenties. It's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good example that age doesn't really affect reactions. It's more about like uh, how polished and sharp can you keep your gameplay. Considering that you don't have much time nowadays, how did your trading approach change? How, uh, how do you practice more efficiently nowadays? Uh, mm. I actually don't have an answer to that. I think it's more of just like, I don't really have a training regimen. It's more of just kind of like, I just kind of play the game um, as often as I can. Uh, usually I only really play games when I stream. So when it's like, when I'm like offline, uh, I don't really play games at all. I just kind of like focus on work and family. So when I do stream, I really just kind of like, just grind, uh, grind rank match or like kind of like learn new characters. Uh, cause one of my favorite things to do in a new fighting game is to learn the whole cast. So, and the reason why I do that is because if I learn the whole cast and I know what their pros and cons are, so I can't really have an excuse of not knowing the matchup. Right. Cause a lot of people are like, yo, I don't know the matchup. And I'm like, well, that's probably because you only play one character. So me, I like playing all the characters so I can know the matchups and how to counter them and if i play because if i play those characters online then i see how other people are reacting to these characters 
that gives me an idea of like, okay, you could do this, you could do that type of thing. Um, I do say in my downtime, I watch a lot of matches um, in general, just because I love watching Street Fighter. Like I love fighting games, right? So it's kind of like my Netflix. It's kind of like my 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 episodes of the week type of thing when you're trying to catch up on a show. I watch a lot of matches and that I would say that also really helps because like when I'm watching a match, it's not really just watching a match, right? It's not watch it's not really watching Ryu versus Ken just fight. I'm watching like, okay, like how good is this person spacing? How good is their execution, their decision making? Like I'm looking at all these tendencies because obviously like I I played competitively. So that gives me an idea of like how the character could be played on the high level. And also it gives me an idea of how uh, that player in particular plays, because then let's say if I fight them in the tournament, I'll actually, I'll have a, a, a little bit of a read on them because I watched their, their, their matches right on YouTube. So I would say that's kind of more, I guess that's also part of training um, efficiently for if you don't have time. Uh, because you know, like I think, like eventually, when you get to a point of like, not to say you master a fighting game, but you have a good, a great grasp of fighting game, and you feel like you need to get to the next level of like, let's say you're like kind of like in the area where it's like, where I plateaued, you know. So what do you do? I mean, you watch other people that play your characters, try to get some ideas, try to get like a uh, different type of like inspiration from other people, and. That's kind of what I use when I watch matches against people. Because eventually I just feel like, yeah, like I I might have plateaued in the fighting game. So how do I get over that? Watch other people that play your characters. Watch other people that you admire that play fighting games. And see how they do it and try to add stuff from their game into your game. So yeah, I guess that's kind of my training regimen for, for at the moment. Yeah, that's also uh, a part of it, right? Uh, watching others do what you can't or don't know how to yeah. do. So, yeah. uh, you've been to Japan not that long ago and played the top Japanese MVC2 players. How do you feel about the Japan's Marvel scene? And are there any interesting similarities or differences to how the game is played in NA? Mm. I feel like the Mars Capcom two scene. I mean, it it has evolved uh, because uh, people just kept playing the game and everything like that. So that's great. I think for the Japanese scene, uh, they has all they gotten a lot better to the point where like they are playing in NA level. Uh, but I would say the top NA players at the moment, they're probably still like the best. Um, I do think. Besides Japan, there's like other countries that are probably better than Japan in in Mars Capcom 2. Like uh, I would say people in the Philippines, uh, Philippine the Marvel's Capcom 2 Philippine scene is super strong, and also Mexico, Mexico Marvel 2 scene is strong. So if NA is number one, then it's either Philippine or Philippines or Mexico as number two, and then probably after those two fight, then it'll be Japan. I would say that's how I rate it because the Japanese Marvel 2 scene, it's like, um, it's a niche group, right? It's only probably like a, a round of like maybe like five to seven players. While like Mexico and Philippines, they actually have like double digit numbers of people that still play. Um, so I know recently like a few of like um, the really great NA players uh, went over to the Philippines. And yeah, I mean, they the Philippine players like held, held their turf, right? Held their ground and everything like that. So yeah, I would say they're probably more of the threat, I would say, compared to Japan. You've been pretty active in supporting the local FGC in Vancouver uh, in any way you can. Uh, did you learn something new or interesting from that experience? Um, you know, like I moved to Vancouver because of family and I know uh, Vancouver Street Battles here. Uh, you know, I, I know Kenny, he's Air, aka Air. He's a great friend. Um, so I know he's working really hard to support the scene and everything like that. And a lot of times I don't, I can't really attend to the locals because it's always on a, a Saturday. And then like, I'm always traveling or if anything, like it's kind of like family time. So it's really hard to find time to, to go to the local. Uh, so in order, I feel like I still need to support the local somehow. Right. 
So I support the local by letting them use my stream so they get more people exposure and check, you know, check them out. Cause I feel like a lot of times there's so many like locals that have streams, but they don't get like, like any numbers or any visibility because of like, everyone is so used to watching like, like the NOPCs or like the Wednesday night fights or like, you know, the TNSs, but like all these other tournaments, they don't really get a lot of recognition. And, uh, I try to support more of like people showing up to local events because like, since I get a lot of free stuff, um, from like companies and everything like that, I give those, I give those, uh, stuff to the locals so they could give away as a raffle. Right. And they, and then, you know, if you show up to the tournament, you're entered into a raffle automatically. Right. So you have a chance to win something there. Um, so I do that like every month, every month I just give them like a whip load of stuff and they just could do whatever they want. Like I just gave them like nine combo sticks, <laughs> like literally last month. Right. So they can just do giveaways or use it for like, uh, like, um, loaner sticks, uh, for people that don't have sticks. Right. So I try to support it from, from that perspective, maybe from like a, a back end side instead of a, instead of a front end side. So that's just my current role. I wish I can do more obviously, but it's just so hard because I, I think I already do so much. Um, so, so I hope I can, you know, um, do better in that, I would say. Yeah. Very interesting. And do you have any goals or ambitions for, for yourself as a TO or maybe like someone who, uh, just helps to like give publicity to those locals? Um, I don't know about goals or anything. It's just, I didn't never really thought that far of like because I, I don't have any like intentions hidden intentions or anything it's just more just like it's just more of like just me doing it for just uh just to be a nice person i would say like it's kind of like how i fly out like players to tournaments right if they win i don't i don't ask them hey can i get my money back can i get a cut or anything like that i'm just like i just want them to have the experience because like a lot of times like everybody's upbringing is different and you know some people just can't do it right because you know money is tight it's hard like depends so i always uh want to make sure i can give the opportunity because growing up going to these tournaments i mean like i was i've been in the scene since in 2000 i wasn't sponsored until 2010 right so it's like 10 years of like trying to earn my own money going to these tournaments and like for what you know like winning 300 bucks at like mario's Capcom 2 tournaments and everything like that it's it wasn't really meant for the money it's just meant for i just did it for the passion right because yeah i mean i wasn't raking in cash like uh, during those times it was just me just doing it because it was it was such an amazing experience and a life-changing experience just because who would have thought I would never have thought I would travel to all these places. In my head, I'm like, I would have thought I was stay in New York, work at a boring office job, you know, do what my Asian parents want me to do. But here I am rebelling against my Asian parents and now I'm paying for them. So, you know, the, the risks worked out, I guess, but I didn't think it was going to turn out to like this. It just magically happened. And yeah, super blessed about it. And because like, like, I, I became super blessed. I want to help other people. Right. So that's kind of, uh, my goal. Cause what if, cause like, there's like, um, there's some players that I, I, I sponsored the tournaments and everything like that. And now they're sponsored. Right. So that's like, that's sick. And like I said, I don't ask for anything back. So I'm just happy for them because that's kind of what I want. I want them to get like those opportunities, right? Like, because I guess from a player perspective, I can, I have a better judgment of like who can, who possibly is like grinding, who has the potential of becoming the next big star. Right. And because like other players, you know, they just look at numbers, they look at results and that's it right that Right. But you know, you never know, you never know. You can get that next diamond in the rough type of thing. Right. And then see what happens. So there was a lot of players like that, that I helped and they're doing so good for themselves now. So I'm pretty, pretty happy about that. Um, and I hope I can keep doing that. Yeah. I, I would say it's not an exaggeration to say that we all are blessed to have you in FGC. So <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> 
And um, uh, how would you compare fighting game culture and communities in the US and Canada? You know, what are the biggest differences? Mm, I think the biggest difference is uh, Canada, they don't like to take risk or they don't know how to how to keep how to like advance forward i guess like i don't know it's just kind of weird like the canadian scene is is different i think it's more of just like there we don't have a lot of events right all the events are like in america and because of that it's just sometimes it's like expensive because living in canada is expensive um at least in vancouver and toronto i'm pretty sure but there are a lot of great Canadian players out there. I think when it comes down to it, they just want to play. And I don't think they they have the the knowledge of trying to like, how do I get those opportunities? You know, sometimes it's like, what well, maybe I, I can get good enough um, and hopefully like a local sponsor will sponsor me because they see how good I am. Uh, but a lot of times it's it's it doesn't really work like that anymore, right? It's like, you have to put yourself out there, social media, get people to recognize you. You have to invest in yourself to go to tournaments and prove that you belong in, in, in a lot of these scenarios, right? Like, it's, it is tough. And because, like, and it, there's so many amazing USA players that kind of, that, that do go to events already, that stream, that has a great social following. They're going to be looked at first before the can before the Canadian players. So it's it's very unfortunate. It's it's I know it's very hard for a lot of players. It's super competitive. Um but yeah, I, I do wish things would change. I think it's also uh, a lot of Canadian brands, they don't know what esports is. Like they don't believe in it compared to America. You know what I mean? Like so I think it it, it will still take time. There are people uh, that work really well in Canada for esports. Like the gaming stadium is amazing. They tr they sponsored a few FTC players a few years ago before the pandemic, um, and they're doing a bunch of stuff, right? But I think they're more into like like overall like the whole scope of esports, not just fighting games. So when you think about that, it would take a while, I think, still for a lot, for Canadian brands to sponsor fighting game players. I think so. It would still take take some time but i do think if people invest in themselves uh they would have a bigger chance higher chance but even then it's not a guarantee it's still a risk overall but it just depends on how much risk do you want to take to put to put to make this a passion to reality um and that's the tough part like because i don't want to tell you hey spend all your savings to go to tournament maybe you get sponsored i don't want to tell you that but that's what happened to me like I only had a thousand dollars to my name and I went to Southern and I went to so and I moved to SoCal. So that, that, and that, and moving to SoCal, that's how I got on evil geniuses. A thousand dollars to my name, you know? So I worked, once I got there, I worked regular jobs, went to tournaments still, did the same thing. And eventually it just, after one year worked. So it's, uh, it's not easy, you know? No, nothing's ever easy. Sometimes you got to get lucky. Sometimes you got to take risk. That's what it comes down to. Now, that's unfortunate that there are not uh, as many opportunities in Canada as there are in the US. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one question I wanted to ask is, like, it's about Daigo Perry. Uh, it's one of the most legendary moments in esports, right? Mm -hmm. Uh uh, but what does it feel like to live with the legacy of being someone who's been on a receiving end of such a legendary play? Um, you know, I, I guess I never really cared too much about it or never thought about it. I didn't think it was going to get to that level of like uh, how famous and fandom and everything like that. Now I'm like pretty, pretty positive about it because, you know, I'll get a lot of people asking me, well, telling me I got into fighting games because of that moment. So, so let's say if that moment never happened, that means there's a chance that person would not have played fighting games. So that's how I look at it as because like so many people get inspired by like sick fighting game moments, and because like this is something from 2004, and we're in 2023, 
and people are still talking about how this got me in the fighting games. That's crazy. You know, I feel like that's just, that's so sick. That's insane. Um, so I'm super happy about that, actually. And yeah, I mean, I know people love it. People always, you know, meme about it all the time. But yeah, it doesn't really bother me as much. It's because, like, I want more people to play fighting games. Uh, we actually wondered, like, you've played a lot of Third Strike on Fightcade, and uh, we had a suspicion that maybe you knowingly do a lot of uh, SA3 neutral to give people a chance to do the famous Daigo, Daigo Perry. I do. I, I let people. I, I I give people the opportunity to do the clout for one thousand percent. It's because just because obviously people just like seeing it happen. Like, um, I know some people hate, like, um people bringing up their losses a lot. But to me, it's just like, when I think of a loss, I think like that means I could play better. All right. That's how I look at it. I don't get salty at losing. I just think like, okay, so I'm not perfect. All right. Um, I, there's something I could have done better. So with this, obviously it's a, it's a meme and we live in an era where like social media, people love engagements and everything. To be honest, it's, it's a really easy engagement. If I post some, some if I post myself getting par Daigo Perry by a random person, people will just love that shit, right? So I'm like, yeah, there you go. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't really bother me. I personally retweeted your uh, you being Daigo Perry last year. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was a streak. It was a, it was a, I was like, damn, everyone just got it, huh? Uh, and uh, is there any specific moment in your career that holds a special place in your heart? Um. Probably Evo 2014 uh, for Marvel's Capcom 3 when I won. I think it's that one, I really worked hard on that game uh, just because I, I played a team that wasn't meta at all. Like, you know, everyone plays Morrigan, Dr. Doom, Virgil, Zero, Magneto. I'm just playing Wolverine, Storm, Akuma. This is a day one team that played in vanilla Marvel 3. And I tried playing top tier characters. But they were just not fun to me. And when it comes to a fighting game, I don't really care about like what's meta and what's not meta as long as it's what feels good in my hands. That's how I pick who I want to play. Um, and I thought Wolverine Stor Storm Akuma was that combination. Any combination of like playing Zero May Cry or Morgan Doom or a Phoenix team. Yeah, to me, it just didn't felt right. It didn't felt good. But, so the fact that I was like stuck, with, I stuck with that team and everyone was cheering for me to win, especially the, the year prior, I got second place. Um, It felt amazing just because like, I felt like I beat so much walls during that because my team was so, you know, was 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 hard to play. It was it was not the easiest to win with. It, it That felt just the... Uh, amazing and because it felt so amazing i think i would say that win was like a, a very emotional win because i worked so hard on it fascinating thank you and as someone who helped many new players uh what, what would you say is the most common misconception uh, newbies have about fighting games that might hold them back mm. i mean i guess they're they're they always say fighting games are hard they get discouraged after one day. And that's not a misconception. It's true. Um, I think that's really true. I think the problem with people is that they think they could get good in fighting games very fast and become famous. So I get a lot of people's like, yeah, I'm, I just, I'm start, I'm starting to pick up street fighter. How do I, how do I become pro? I'm like, wait, what? Well, you know, like that's such a vague question. Like you can't just become you, you're like, okay, I just want to become pro. And I never played fighting game before. That's a long road, you know. Like I just don't. It's not something you can just pick up and become like amazingly godlike at, and then get sponsored right away. Um, I think that's the misconception. But I don't even think that's a misconception of fighting games. I think that's a misconception of uh, younger people trying to become a pro gamer. They think they could just become a pro gamer very easily, but a lot of the, it takes a lot of time, effort, practice. Uh, you know, studying, researching, it doesn't really become a video game at this point, right? It becomes like homework. Right? It becomes like you're going to school, you know, like when you think about frame data, that's math. 
right? It's like you're back, you're back in school all over again. So, I think the that's the misconception. I feel like people should play video games for fun, how it's intended to be. And obviously, when you're getting better, then you can, you know, start to think about, hey, maybe I can go to a tournament, see how well I do, right? Don't p quit your job and be like, hey, I'm going to become a pro gamer now or whatever like that. Um, it just takes time. I feel like just the thought process of like, I'm going to become a pro gamer now. I've never played, I've never played X game in my life. That's just, I think that's the the wrong misconception to have. I see. Uh, so uh, you managed to go from a top, top level competitor to quite also quite successful YouTuber and consistent streamer. Uh, do you think those two are different professions and can someone create FGC content without being a top player? Hmm. So, yeah, I would say they're different content because like when you watch other players play and they're really good at their games, that doesn't mean they're really that doesn't mean they're going to be good at entertaining an audience. Right? So, I think like talking while playing is is a pretty hard skill to pick up, especially if you're trying to answer the questions and like you're trying to like your viewers, you're trying to like make funny jokes. Stuff like that, you, you don't really get it too much uh, from other fighting game streamers, and I get it. It's hard. It's not. It's not easy. It's a, it's something that you will eventually, hopefully, pick up while streaming a lot. Um, I do think majority of successful content creators that are players, uh, they have they you know they have a funny side. They they like to like, like joke and banter. Uh, but and I also do think non-pro players, um. They're the ones that have a more successful YouTube channel, right? Like, if you look at like a lot of like the big guys, like Maximilian, Rufo Monger, uh, Super V, they're not pro players, but they love fighting games and they have an amazing ability to talk about fighting games and show off fighting games, right? And like, and explain to the casual perspective on why this fighting game is great. But then you'll have other players that are pro players, they'll just post up a 20 minute video of like, them playing rank match, right? With no commentary or anything like that. So which one would you rather watch? I guess at that point, it just depends on what you, what, what you personally want. But from a, from, I would say a majority casual perspective, they're going to want something where there's more information that's being said that uh, just gameplay. Because if it's just straight gameplay, how they're supposed to know that was the advanced technique, or this is like something that like, you know, you have to learn, blah, blah, blah. Like this is the general strategy. You need commentary for all that, right? And that's why we have amazing commentators as well, because that they they do such an amazing job at like explaining things. And they're, you know, I would say commentators are also they would be labeled as content creators as well too. I see. Thank you. And during the recent Twitch Rivals tournament, Mike Ross mentioned that you are a closet grappler. Uh, do you agree? And if not, how do you defend your choice of Manon in SF6? I, I I play Cammy now. I don't know what Mike <laughs> Ross is talking about. Um, but you know, I like Manon a lot just because like like I said, I, I play characters based off like how they look. And Manon, she you know, she she got that Karen, you know, French vibe going on and yeah, she she was sick. She was she's a sick character. So yeah, I don't believe what Mike Ross says. I mean he 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 told me he, he's not playing Honda because he's good. So he purposely plays low tier characters on purpose. So because he purposely plays low tier characters on purpose, that means he wants to lose. So yeah, so don't believe in somebody that wants to lose says. And what's your opinion on the tiers of uh, the characters in SF6? Because everyone has their own idea who's strongest, who's not. Like the consensus is that J JP is probably very strong, but who do you feel is the weakest? I feel like from the mid-level and cash perspective, do you would put JP or Honda up there? From the top level perspective, which is kind of like um the same like same amount same characters that I have on the list, I would say like Ken, Luke, Guile, EJ, right? And then the fifth one's kind of up for grabs. I would I would put Cammy there personally. Uh, but I would say those uh four minimum, they're the really real problem characters in my opinion. Uh, because I'm just thinking from a, a long-term perspective. When you have characters like DJ 
and Honda, those are characters that will beat everybody's ass the first month because, you know, it's, you got to learn the matchup, right? Like, they're not like traditional characters. But if you look at them, they're not the most stable characters when you, when you think about what are my options against XYZ. The other characters I mentioned, like Luke, EJ, Guile, uh, Ken, they might take a little bit longer to learn because of execution and spacing and not a lot of damage output, but they are the most stable when it comes down to their move list. And a lot of players have like those similar four characters up there, especially like Japanese players as well, too. So I think that's my current, my current tier list, I would say. Let's see. Thank you. And from a mechanic standpoint, how would you rate Street Fighter VI uh, out of all other Street Fighter games? Hmm. A lot of people say it's the best Street Fighter game of all time already. It's hard. Um, Street Fighter Four is really good. Street Fighter Three is really good. Uh, but for me, I would say it would have to be either Street Fighter Three or Street Fighter Six, because right now maybe. Maybe asking me this question like two months down the road. Because like I said, I'm in the honeymoon phase of Street Fighter 6. So I'm always going to be like, Street Fighter 6 is the best game in the world right now. So that's how, I, that's how I would feel right now, right? So maybe two months later down the road, after my honeymoon has, you know, gone off my chest, I might say something different. I will make sure to reach out to you on Twitter and <laughs> put your, <laughs> your new opinion yeah. in the comments. Okay. Uh, so, Street Fighter VI set a new standard for uh, what a newly released fighting game should be. It has content, depth, and most importantly, great netcode. Uh, could this have an F effect on, uh, on success of other games that can't reach this level? Hmm. It definitely set the bar. 100% it set the bar. Like, Street Fighter VI has a full package of everything that's like, if you are a AAA title, you need something like this. Right, so it's a good thing that Street Fighter 6 came out first because it gives like Mortal Kombat 1 and Tekken 8 a chance to be like, look at Street, look how the success of Street Fighter 6, how can we match that? Right, obviously not every game can do that because obviously some indie titles might not have the opportunity to do so, right? But I'm hoping like people keep that trend going up of like, of how of how what of how uh, Street Fighter Six really changed the game, but even if then it's I don't think Street Fighter Six changed the game. I think it was mainly Guilty Gear Strive, that's the one that really changed the game because, you know, they came out during the pandemic and the netco was like freaking amazing, and because of that, that's where everyone's like, we need rollback, we need rollback, we need rollback, right? And Street Fighter Five, I mean, didn't have the best rollback. It was pretty crappy rollback. You know, Tekken Seven, they tried didn't work out so you'll see your strive led that online online infrastructure for sure and got everybody to like really do rollback and obviously rollback has always been there like you know ki 2013 had rollback skullgirls had rollback but guilty your strive was the was the one game that was like popular popularized from like everybody in the community that's like oh my god guilty your strive netcode so good right and you know like I said, even though there's other games that had such so good netcodes, they weren't as popular, and because of that, they didn't get their you know their their roses and everything like that. But Guilty Gear Strive is the one that really put the mainstream on the map because of online, and then followed up with Street Fighter Six. You know, using that using netcode like that, making sure like netcode's so good. But you know, they obviously added a lot more with single player content. Uh, lots of different ways to play online as well too you know so they added so many quality of life stuff uh so much character personality so now future what can fighting what can future fighting games that's coming out can do to rival that you know so they have to they got a lot of tough you know a lot of tough work ahead of them uh, and what effect do you think SF's netcode could have on skill level of underrepresented regions like Africa, Middle East, or even Australia? You know, it's um, when I play on Fightcade, there's so many players from like different regions all around the world I play, and I'm like, wow, they're really good. Like, I played against Germany, like uh, someone from Germany who plays Oro, 
and he might have been the best oral player I ever fought in my life, right? I would have never known unless I played unless I played on Fightcade and Fightcade had great netcode. So now, with Street Fighter Six, it's doing the same thing, right? You're you're going to have people that has an opportunity to play some of the best players in the world, known best players in the world, right? And you are going to see all that type of stuff. Um, I think that's great. Obviously, I don't see it from a CPT perspective where you have somebody from South Africa versus like somebody from California. They're not going to set that up like that online, right? But it's possible for you to pl connect. I played with people from Japan, Taiwan, and the netcode was like, they were like next door to me. That's how it felt. So because of that, I'm super excited to to see a lot of the players that are like probably never even had a shot or a chance to play their favorite top players, but now they can. So I think that's a fantastic, fantastic opportunity for like literally every like underrepresented uh, country and player in the world. Thank you. And final few questions. Uh... Riot Games Project L looks like a game that could be up your alley. Uh, are you going to try it out, and what should it do to uh, what should it nail to make it to your list of top games? Oh man, I'm excited for Project L. Um, I think it's already on my list of like must try top game because uh, very Marvel ish. Uh, you know, has all these air combos, has assists, lots of creativity going on. Um, I never really, I, I, I played like League, League of Legends, like way, way like beginning year one type of thing. But I know all the characters. Like I follow like a lot of that type of stuff just because like uh, my wife likes League of Legends in general. Um, but I'm super excited just because like the people that are working on it, I have full trust. Like the cannons, they worked on Rising Thunder and that game was fantastic. It was super fun. Um, I played it a lot and I love what they did with like simple controls and how they like you were still able to to have like this advanced like strategy and everything like it, it was still really fun um and I hear like so many people in the fighting community are working on Project L like they had a video of Unconquerable on there that was a freaking awesome um so I'm super excited to see like people showing off Project L whenever hopefully I don't know I don't know when it's coming out but it's something that I'm just like, I really want to see more. You know, I, I'm super excited to see other characters. Um, you know, I know they released that six minute trailer, I think like what, last year or something like that. I forgot, but it was a long trailer and it just looked fantastic. It looked amazing. So I, I, I'm super excited to see what's more to come. Uh, have you seen Arcane? Oh, the, the Netflix show? Yeah. I actually, I actually did not watch Arcane, the Netflix show. You know, I, it's so hard for me to catch up on shows. Like, I have so many shows, like, on my wish list. It's crazy. Like, I, I, I it's on my list, but I haven't watched it. Um, is it something I should watch? Uh, I mean, it's absolutely very good, and I would recommend to watch it, like, before the game comes out. Uh, it's, it's, oh, it's, you spo is it spoilers? Uh, not really, but it, uh, like, Project L has some... Or, uh, stages that take place in Arcane, so... Okay, that's cool. Yeah. And uh, what are your biggest hobbies outside of fighting games? Uh, biggest hobbies outside of fighting games? I like going to the movie theaters. <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I like going to the movie theaters. Um, I was pretty sad that I couldn't go to movie theaters during the pandemic. Like, super sad. Uh, but yeah, I like that... I don't really have, I guess fighting games are my hobby. Like I, it's, I know it's like a, it's like a job now or whatever, but like, you know, it's just, I can just play fighting games forever. Personally. Like I feel like 20 years from now I can still play fighting games. Um, but I guess my hobbies now because I'm a dad is just really showing, uh, Harper the world, you know, trying to get, it's like, okay. Yeah, Cause I didn't. I didn't have the opportunity growing up as a kid, but but now since I can grant that opportunity, I would rather you know give her what give her what she deserves. Give her what I couldn't have. So that's kind of. I guess that's. I guess I guess that's a hobby, right? Or maybe that's just the a parent thing to do. But yeah, definitely it makes me feel happy doing it. Yeah, whatever it is, I I think it's the best 
think anyone can do so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, when are we uh, going to have next seasonal anime videos? <laughs> YouTube. The what? Uh, best uh, seasonal anime. <laughs> oh man, the best seasonal anime. Bad time. The bad time right now. I I I haven't caught up with lots of animes, but if there is one anime I would recommend to watch this season, it's a uh, Oshino Koi. Watch Oshino Koi. Just trust me. First episode's an hour long. I'm not gonna spoil it. Watch it to the end. You might think I'm on I'm like stupid for watching it because in the beginning you'd be like, bro, why am I watching this? Just just give it a chance. All right. Just give it a chance. And then you know it just takes it just takes it just takes a whole hour for you to to to, to get sucked in. That's how I think of it. And what should we expect from Justin Wong in 2023 and beyond? Mm. Um, that's, that's a tough question. I feel like what I've been doing is probably what to expect. Um, my YouTube channel has been doing pretty good. Um, and going to tournaments, playing fighting games. I don't know. I've, I've been so busy lately that I haven't had the chance to think about the future, uh, for this year. I'm just trying to go one day at a time when it comes down to it, right? Uh, but definitely I work really hard on the YouTube channel and yeah, I'm, I'm super stoked. I, I guess more, more IRL videos. Um, I, that was really fun to do. Just like having my own booth, investing in like my own equipment and making a YouTube video based off that. Uh, cause I, I watch a lot of YouTube videos of like other people doing like band on the street IRL type of stuff. Um, so I'm really glad that people enjoyed watching that, watching, um, that type of stuff for me. So yeah, I guess look forward to more of me torturing, uh, poor tournament attendees. And any final words to your fans? Um, just thank you guys for supporting me, watching fighting games, loving fighting games, keep loving fighting games, like literally never stop playing fighting games. And if if your hands can't play fighting games, enjoy fighting games in a different way. Like maybe like commentating or like just watching in general, or like, you know, just, just support fighting games. We are a small community, uh, but I do think we're the the most lovable community as well too. Like there's so much drama everywhere else. I don't care about the drama everywhere else, but I think seeing our community, like the fact that we always look out for one another when it counts, when it matters, that's the important stuff. So yeah, I appreciate everybody loving fighting games. Thank you. Thank you so much.